uh, establish a really, really solid bedrock um, and to, I don't know, like plant, to have really fertile soil so that in performance, spontaneity can kind of take the form of unexpected plants and, and, and flora and all of that beautiful stuff. I, that's, that feels very much like what performing, uh, that feels reflective of performing for me. And uh, also something that influences my work, my preparation work, is, is my own experience as a composer. I, I, I'm, I write it a lot and I think I tend these days to approach scores, all scores, as though I were approaching a brand new work. Because I do perform a decent amount of brand new work, and I commission new work from composers, and, and, the, and you tend to, at least in my experience, I tend to be more generous, actually, with newer work. I, I tend to spend the time to try to figure out what a composer, to me, in my opinion, is trying to do. And I spend more time trying to tease out intentions and exploring possibilities. And, and so I try to do that with old music as well. And the Kajaturian I would call very old music. And of course, a lot of what we play as concert pianists is very, very old music, centuries old. And I, I try to approach it with the same, uh, ideally with the same freshness uh, that I would with, with, with a brand new score. And not to mention that the older you go, the less directions there are oftentimes for yeah. the, the, the performers. And it's really interesting, I mean, we're, we're now going into a conversation uh, away from the Kajaturian, but I, I, I love thinking about how in early, earlier music, especially Mozart, Mozart's like my pet topic in a way, uh, we have, we are often like governed by these very misguided notions, I think, of historical accuracy, quote unquote, and which often has less to do with actual historical accuracy uh, and much more to do with this very vague notion of refinement that we're trying to uh, achieve. And that really has nothing to do with the work, because if you actually go and do your real research, if you do actual scholarship, you find that Mozart is brash, Mozart is pranksterish, Mozart is unpredictable, Mozart is funny, and Mozart is above all else dramatic and operatic. And there's so much of this kind of notion that I feel like I absorbed in music school kind of through osmosis of Mozart as polite, and dainty and harmless, and and that always bummed me out a little bit. Oh well, yeah. I, I think the, the so, but anyway, that, exactly that, that, that's yeah. But uh, you're absolutely right. So, so interpretively, with with the Kajaturian, for example, I, I tried to look at it because I remember the first time I encountered the work, I found it almost like unmanageable and unwieldy and, and really challenging to make any sort of sense of. Um, the only thing that immediately stuck out was the fact that this was like maybe the most aggressively Soviet thing I had ever heard. And I couldn't even tell you exactly why, but just based on maybe previous familiarity with uh, other you know, music of that period from the Soviet Union, um, and of course knowing a little bit about the principles of uh, Soviet realism, of socialist realism, uh, I guess that, that was my immediate emotional response. But in terms of understanding the piece informally, it was really challenging, and, and it was an interesting uh, journey to get to a place where I felt like I could actually say something with the work and, and still feel like I was being honest about it. Yeah, I, I, you know, what you're saying is so interesting about it being the most kind of aggressively Soviet piece that you've played or heard. Um, you know, this was in 1937 is, is when it was written, and uh, he, he was uh, born in Georgia, but he was really culturally Armenian, and the Armenian genocide had happened in 1915. I mean, so... Uh, the, the Armenians really were very happy to become part of the Soviet bloc in many respects, and it's important to know that Kajaturian his entire life was an absolute believer in communism. He was uh, faithful to the Communist Party all through his life, mostly in favor the entire time, very much a celebrated composer. So you don't have the bitter irony of Shostakovich. You don't have sort of the, the Prokofian longings for, for a, a, you know, a European or a different society. Uh, you don't have that at all. I mean, you have, to all intents and purposes, a fairly straightforward and, and happy guy. I mean, writing, you know, people's music that, that, was, a, that was really, that Stalin really approved of for the most part, which is a really interesting thing. But it's also tough because uh, you really delve into the socio-political reality of the composers, which I think is, again, just really a fascinating thing for a performer to do. So, uh, talk a bit about the, the, the way that he overlays Armenian music with uh, the, the Soviet. Well, I find that really fascinating in general, in this work, because the way that Armenian music figures in the piece is complex, at least for me. Because um, there is this kind... 
to be perfectly frank, I think I had a I had an ambiguous reaction to it at first because to me it struck me as a little bit of a self-orientalizing gesture, which I struggle with. I don't know if I particularly struggle with it as a person of Asian heritage, but I think I was very at first I was rather sensitive to it. Um, and then I did a little bit more research and I thought about the history a little more, and it's interesting to consider how I think in this particular period of of, of the USSR. Uh, you have you have this era of very specific kinds of ethnic nationalism being encouraged, uh, or like sorts of cultural nationalism, and so the way that Armenian music figures in this work, and I would argue in a lot of Kajaturian's music, is more aesthetic than historical. Um, by which I mean. I don't believe, I don't think Kajaturian too often uses uh, folk material that really comes from, you know, Armenian folk tradition. A lot of it is just his own original material that fits within a notion of Armenian music. It's, it's kind of Armenian music in quotation marks from a certain vantage point. And I, th I find that actually very compelling and, and odd and complex and so, I like to think of it when I'm playing the work as, as an imagined reality, an imagined notion of Armenian music or an imagined notion of a folk tradition that might not really be real. It's just, it's an image. It's an aestheticized, maybe sanitized, but certainly just uh, idealized vision. Yeah, the specific example you gave last night was uh, Bartok, who actually went out into the hills of his right. native Hungary and recorded. It's not an, it, yeah, this is not an anthropological project, right. basically. Although yeah. he did go back to Armenia quite a lot right. and, and just kind of soaked himself in the music, but he didn't exactly transcribe it and then use it in his music. And I hope it doesn't come across like I'm uh, accusing it of any sort of like inauthenticity, because I don't think that that sort of authenticity game is particularly productive in this conversation. But I think it's interesting to because there, weirdly enough, it almost means that there's more of an emotional charge, or more of a very, very specific emotional charge to this music compared to if it were like a more anthropological project, I think. Yeah, and you have a lot of composers right before Kajaturian, the five, Rimsky, Korsakov, and, and Mussorgsky, and these other composers who were trying to get away from Europe and sound very, very Russian, and they were using Russian folk themes, and they were just really, really immersing themselves. They were using, breaking all kinds of rules in, in European part writing, using parallel fifths and octaves, all these things that, that, that you hear in folk music. And with Kajaturian, he's actually looking before that, I think, to this kind of, I, and, and even with, with his version of Russian romanticism in music, I think that's also idealized. And then overlaying that with this Armenian idealizations, um, and you'll hear it in the music, you'll hear some themes, especially in the second movement, that will sound like folk themes, and they are. They're, they're either an actual folk theme, or as, as Conrad has said more often than not, it's, it's a dim memory of a folk theme that he has. This is also probably a good time to mention that the structure of the piece is really kind of almost like freeform in certain ways. I mean, you mentioned the, these like waves of almost idealized Russian romanticism. There's one particular passage in the last movement that fascinates me. Um, it's just this material that comes in and it's it, the aesthetic register of it is pretty much entirely like pseudo Rachmaninoff kind of piano writing. And it sticks out because it's, it's so different from the rest of the work. Um, the, the piece is full of moments like that, where it almost flips into a different register just for like two minutes, and then it just changes course again. And there are all these lengthy cadenzas in the piece. There's like three major, major cadenzas that make up a huge portion of the work. And, and even calling them cadenzas feels almost wrong, um, in the same way that calling the Prokofiev two cadenza, for example, feels almost wrong because it's such a structural part of the work. It's not even. It's not just a improvisation for the soloist, it's, it becomes a structure, a massive structural element in the piece. And uh, it's, I think I've approached it almost as a ballet score. And these massive solo Which is passages. The it's, way that it, it's paired. Uh, yes, that's true. I hadn't even thought of that. Um, but these massive solo sections, it's sort of, I can almost imagine the spotlight. I can imagine the, the image of the, the single dancer um, as opposed to the ensemble pieces, you know? It's, that's, that's become my strategy in a lot of ways for this work. Oh, that's interesting. Um, 
Yeah, just for the audience, uh, the, the traditional concerto, the cadenza was basically the orchestra would stop and the soloist would show his or her stuff. They would improvise something on some of the themes from the, the concerto. But over time, or, over the years, as Conrad mentioned, the, the, the cadenza often became more a structural part of the piece. And in fact, we talked about this a little bit last night, the, the traditional concerto also, the pianist, if it were a piano concerto, for example, was very much kind of apart from the orchestra. And the orchestration was minimal, meant to really highlight the piano. But in later concertos now, a lot of times that's more interesting. Integrated. Um, but I don't want to talk about that because we only have a couple minutes left before you have to go. So I wanted it's something that we touched on last night. Oh, it was really fascinating. I want to come back to it today, which is just kind of a, you know, your job as a soloist is to find out all this information about the piece to, to kind of to a certain extent faithfully interpret it. Of course, you're a composer and improviser too, so you can bring some things to the table yourself. But one of the things you said was with the concerto format, you're particularly interested in uh, taking some liberties, you know, injecting maybe some rhythmic liberties and, and uh, not just being this kind of, you know, Slavic person, it's difficult to do because you're with the orchestra and you have to stay with them. Uh, just can, expand on that a little bit, if you would. I love, I love sort of playing around people. Sometimes I think that playing, I think part of that's actually influenced by just uh, not only working in improv, uh, improvisational contexts, but also just listening to a lot of jazz improvisation growing up. And there's so much playing around beats. Um, I think in a way we're still working against the tyranny of the bar line to sort of quote Schumann, I think. Um, I'm sorry, it's a Stravinsky quote. Is uh, it Stravinsky? I have to point it out because oh, he's on the program today. Yeah. Um, and the tyranny of the bar line is a very real thing. Um, and I would say it's like also kind of the tyranny of the pulse. Um, because I actually would argue that if you play around a pulse, that pulse is more felt. Uh, I like the idea of something having more presence by by having a very clear opposite. I don't know exactly what I'm saying here. But uh, I, I, I just, I think concertos playing is a really interesting, tense space to explore that because as you said, you have 65, 70 people up on stage with you. You can't just be completely anarchic. It's kind of impolite. <laughs> among other things, and uh, and but but also I think that's what's attractive to me about it is it pers it's it's not easy to do, and you have to have a lot of trust to do that, which I find very appealing. You have to actually have a very solid sense of how the rhythmic structure of the whole thing with everyone on board, uh, how that all works. But I I like I like injecting risk into performance. I think in general, and, and that's one way of doing it. And I've 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 told Carlos. Uh, you know, I, I told him after last night's performance, which was a lot of fun, but I told him it's like it's going to be completely different tomorrow. It's going to be completely different. I, you know, I think there is definitely a part of me that feels like the moment that they can anticipate what you're doing, you've lost. Okay. You know, so that's uh, going against the tyranny of the conductor. Or... Perhaps, perhaps, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I am an anarchist deep down. Who knows? Conrad, thank you so much. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you. Good night, please, for Conrad Tower. It's all us tonight. So it really isn't had anything in common, I mean politically, ideologically, aesthetically, you name it.